Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya We were discussing the first hadith of Babun Fisidq the chapter of truthfulness or the chapter of honesty Allahu alayhi wa sallam said certainly truthfulness leads to goodness and certainly goodness leads to paradise and certainly man continues to be truthful until he is written in the court of Allah as Siddiq meaning a truthful person and certainly lonely man continues to lie until he is written in the court of Allah Kadhab, a liar so he mentioned the commentaries of this hadith uh, just the final one or two points before we move on to the next hadith so we mentioned that Sidq, truthfulness, truthfulness is a Ta'ala when he's speaking about truthfulness, he's speaking about it very broadly. It incorporates what we call truthfulness, speaking the truth, not lying. That's a type of Sidq. Imam Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala speaking about a broader truthfulness and now he in this he speaks about the specific truthfulness to actually speak the truth imam ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala says that sidq is used in six different meanings the word sidq is used in six different meanings and the one who is able to have sidq in sidq will become siddiq will become a truthful person will become the person who this hadith is speaking about the truthful person so according to Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala, the word Sidq is used in six for speech to not any not say anything which is a lie. Truthfulness in the intention. Truthfulness in the intention. The third, Sidqun fi intention. You can also translate this as will. The will to do something, to be truthful in this way. Number four, Sidqun fil azm. To be truthful in azam. Azam is a very strong intention. We spoke about this in the first chapter, chapter of uh, uh, sincerity and keeping the intention present. Azam is a very strong intention. If somebody has a normal niyyah of sin, it's not a sin. If somebody has azam of sin, that I will do this sin, then they will be sinful. Because this is a very strong intention, azam. So the, the fourth type of Sidq is Sidqun Fil Azm. Number five, in fulfilling this firm intention. So you made this firm in, and then you get the opportunity. And finally, Sidqun Fi Maqamati Dini Kulliha. To be truthful in all matters of the deen. To be truthful in all matters of the deen. So when it comes to, for example, your zakat and you're paying zakat, to be truthful in regards to your zakat, not to try and cut corners. When it comes to um, paying an expiation, to be truthful, honest and truthful, misinformation so that the ruling changes. So these are the six types of sidq, the six types of truthfulness. Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala says فَمَنِ اتَّصَفَ بِالصِّدْقِ فِي جَمِيعِ ذَلِكْ فَهُوَ صِدِّيقِ Whosoever is attributed with truthfulness and truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala A person who does not try to look for loopholes in the deen is honest in all aspects of the deen And the final point in this in regards to this hadith We see are to hell. Lying is such a thing that this is qabih fi nafsihi. This is evil in itself. It's not the case that somebody has to come to you and tell you lying is bad. We know lying is bad. A person, if lying, giving misinformation regarding a normal incident is so bad, then imagine the state of lying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu 
people who make things in the religion, people who make up narrations of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man kathab maq'adahu min nar then such a person should take up his seat in the fire of hell. This is a huge sin to make up anything regarding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another hadith, we also know that the person who passes on a hadith is responsible in making sure that this is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this, said that, that said the other, and they do not verify the hadith and they can just send the hadith forward. The person who sends a hadith forward without verification is also responsible for sending forward a fabrication. So we should be meticulous in anything that we forward for, uh, in regards to our deen. If somebody, if so, where? Which verse? Is this a hadith Qudsi? Where is this hadith? Did the Prophet ﷺ say this? Where did the Prophet ﷺ say this? Be meticulous and responsible when it comes to Quran and hadith. If this is the punishment of someone who lies on a normal person, Imagine the punishment for one who lies on Allah and the Messenger Azza wa Jalla wa Sallallahu Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala protect us from ever forwarding a fabricated narration to anybody else The next hadith Hadith number 55 Al-Thani an Abi Muhammad Al-Hasan ibn Ali Al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhuma qal حفظت من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دع ما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك فإن الصدق طمأنينة وإن الكذب ريبة رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن قوله يريبك هو بفتح الياء وضمها ومعناه أترك ما تشك في حله وعد إلى منشن this حديث this is from the Jawami ul kalim of the Prophet is from those hadith that are little in meaning but oceanic, little in wording but oceanic in meaning. They have so much behind them. Is a qa'ida min qawa'id deen. Qawa'id deen. This is a principle from the principles of religion. This hadith is narrated by Sayyiduna Imam Hassan bin Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhuma, the grand. Son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The son of Sayyidina Ali The son of Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra Radiyallahu ta'ala Anhuma His manaqib His praise, praises are well known To him as the flower From the garden of paradise From the, the garden of the family Of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He is the first to be named Hassan Sayyidina Ali Whether they have selected the name for the, their son, Sayyidina Ali said yes. And what was the name? Sayyidina Ali said Harb. I want to name him Harb. What's Harb? Harb means war, battle. Sayyidina Ali, line of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the best warriors of the Sahaba, one of the best commanders, the leader of the Muslims, he said, name my son Harb, war. And the Prophet said, before Sayyidina Imam Hassan, nobody had the name Hassan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the name Hassan and Hussein hidden from the people. When Imam Hassan and Hussein were born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet وسلم, these two names. And they were the first of all battle. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Name him Hussein. Meaning handsome, handsome boy. Radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He says, Hafiz to mir Rasulillah. I memorized from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam this advice is so important and we should all memorize this prophetic advice i memorize from the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what did he memorize da ma yaribuka ila ma la yaribuka fa inna as-sidqa tuma'ninatun wal kadhiba ribatun leave that which you are doubtful of for that which you are not doubtful of for indeed, truthfulness is tranquility 
and the lie is a doubt. This is an extremely beautiful hadith from the Qawaid al-Din, from the principles of religion. This in his Arba'een. As hadith number 11 in his Arba'een. So if you want to go to, if you have a copy of Arba'een, you can go there and make your notes on Arba'een. If you have a commentary, you can add this to your commentary. <clears throat> this hadith is teaching us, if you have something in front of you, and it is doubtful. You are doubtful of whether it is halal. What should you do? Leave it. What the hadith is teaching us. If you have something in front of you and your ebook, you're in doubt regarding it or it's causing you doubt, you don't know whether it's halal. What does a, if eating a certain food, it, you're doubtful whether it is halal. What are you not doubtful of? You are not doubtful that if I don't, for that which you know is halal so if you do not know if something is halal it's best to leave it it is best to leave it don't think well it's not haram rather than thinking it's not haram therefore i'll do it i don't know if it's halal well i don't know if it's majority of the food that they serve is haram but there's one dish they serve is halal but then you're hearing people saying all sorts then what to do the prophetic advice is leave it What's so difficult? Why are you so desperate to have that uh, ambiguous food? Leave that ambiguous food, food as a seed. <coughs> if you plant a seed of a specific fruit, that fruit is going to grow. When you eat har haram food, haram actions will be the result of that haram food. When you eat halal food, halal actions will be the result of that food. And when you so if there is something which is ambiguous, leave the ambiguous the ambiguity. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one hadith tells us that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam draws a picture for us of clearly halal, clearly haram and ambiguity. Where he says that the overview of the hadith, imagine, but then you have a small portion Right in the middle, a small portion which is haram. Now a shepherd has taken his flock into this field, into this huge field to eat, to graze. But this shepherd will make sure that the flock stays far away from that land. If he's close, if you are staying away from that which is not haram, then you will definitely stay away from haram. Just like the shepherd He's going to stay in the halal zone. And he's not even going to go close to the ambiguous. If we look at our... They wouldn't think, because it's not haram, I'll do it. That's not how they would think. That's what people ask now. When uh, people come to me and they ask, is it haram? Then I will avoid it. Look at this beautiful example of our pious predecessors, rahimahumullah ta'ala. There was one Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala who said that I love to place a barrier of halal between me and between haram. Think about that for a sec. Certain things which are halal to avoid things which are haram. So things which are ambiguous, you can work out and say, oh, technically they're halal, they're not haram, but avoid them. Lest you fall into the haram. Sayyiduna Ibrahim bin Adham rahimahullah ta'ala was sitting uh, and somebody gave and he didn't drink the water. And they asked him, why don't you drink Zamzam water? And he said, if I had my own bucket, I would have drank the water. They were doing zulm. He said, I don't want to use even the bucket of a unjust government. That, that was the halal that he was avoiding. What we should do at our level, at least avoid the ambiguousness 
at least avoid, avoid the ambiguous ground. If you do not want to reach that level of God consciousness, that's fine. But at least avoid ambiguous grounds. Rather than saying, because it's not haram, I'm going to do it. You should think, because it's not clearly halal, I'm not going to do it. And that's the way that we should be thinking. And growing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a high level of taqwa, which is called wara. Waw, ra, ain. Wara. A high level of taqwa. In the end of the hadith, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam beautifully explains the outcome of this. What did he sallallahu alayhi wasallam say? Inna sidqa فَإِنَّ الصِّدْقَ طُمَأْنِينَةٌ وَالْكَذِبَ رِيبَةٌ Certainly truthfulness is tranquility and lying What is this teaching us? Decision to make and you can either Choose the ambiguous decision or the decision that you know it's clearly halal. If you are truthful to yourself and choose the clearly halal decision, then what will create? This will create tamanina, tranquility. The person will have tranquility at heart. Knows that there's no chance I've eaten haram. But the person who does delve into kathib, a lie and lies to himself and says it's not just eating, it can be anything taking the ambiguity what will happen within that person, he will have riba he will enter a state of doubt he will enter a state of taraddud hesitation, a state of um, feeling humiliated and feeling little then you'll be sound you'll have sukoon Knowing that you, if you did take it, you'd be in the state of ambiguity and hesitation, uneasiness. But not going into that ambiguity and you're not in that state of uneasiness. You have such a person is also credible. A person who avoids ambiguous grounds is also a credible person. This person, Iddatun nafs wa thiqatun nasibihi. This person has is self-dignified, is a dignified person and is a person who people trust whereas a person who tells them loses credibility loses their dignity in the community and loses their credibility and that's why it's you should always reflect on your actions and on your children ambiguity, taking in ambiguous in income can have an impact on your children Feeding them ambiguous food can have impact on them. Ambiguous income. Once the great Imam Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Ismail al Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, whose book is read throughout the world, whose book is a source for the Muslims and is titled the most authentic book after the Quran which is known as Sahih Bukhari this Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala his father Ismail al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala a scholar of the Hanafi school he was when he died he said to his friend who was with him at his uh, on his deathbed he said to him that I do not have a single ambiguous coin in my earnings I do not have a single ambiguous coin in my earnings. And he was proud of this, as he should be. And who was his son? This was the father who fed his son halal. And who was his son? The great Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. Once there was an uh, Imam and he went into the markets and in, in those days they used to sell slaves. So he bought a slave, a slave woman. He brought the slave woman home 
and he started to teach her because he was himself a scholar. He's After a number of years had passed and he had taught her the Islamic sciences, he freed her, then he married her. He freed her and he married her. And then they had a child. He was born, he said to his wife, that only you are allowed to breastfeed and suckle this child. No other woman is allowed to breastfeed and suckle this child. Only you, no one else. That's fine. One day, he comes home and his wife is furious. His wife is really angry. And he asks her, what's happened? And he said that a lady came and she was sitting here and our child started to cry. The baby started to cry. So she took him and breastfed him. So this Imam, hearing this, he took his son, who's a baby, turned him on his front and placed his finger into his uh, child's mouth and made the baby vomit out the milk. Bought you with 100% halal money. And for all those years that you have been living with me, I've only fed you food that was bought with 100% halal money. 100% halal. I know for sure that any milk your body produces is produced from food which is bought from halal income. And I only want our son to consume that which is 100% halal and not even one portion of ambiguity. Not haram, ambiguity. I would rather have a I would rather have no child than to have a child who has taken one morsel of ambiguous food. I would rather have no children than to have one child who has eaten a portion of ambiguous food. This was the food of this young boy. Who was this young boy? This young boy grew up and in the four corners of the world, he is known as Imam al Haramain, the Imam of Mecca and the Imam of Medina. Imam al Haramain. Al Juwaini, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, this was his father. If we want our children to be obedient to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then we need to feed them food and clothe them with clothes that we have earned with the obedience of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If you earn money, disobeying Allah and then expect your children to grow up being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sheikh Muhammad ibn Allan a last point in commentary of uh, this hadith <clears throat> In commenting on this hadith, he asks the question why, and we take that which we know is halal, then we are in a state of tama'nina, tranquility, and contentment. And when we take something which is doubtful, when we lie to ourselves and we take something which is doubtful, then we are in a state of anxiety and hesitation. Why is this? Sheikh Muhammad ibn Allan, the mu'min has been created upon tranquility. Tranquility, innate quality in the believer that pushes the believer towards righteousness, that pushes the believer towards truthfulness, that pushes the believer towards the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is an innate, it is the innate nature of the human to turn away from lying. It is the innate nature of the human, that when the human knows that there is something which is problematic, the human would desire to leave it. But then how this human has accustomed him or herself, they will act accordingly. So on a basic level, a person is inclined towards goodness. A person wants to move away from badness. But if this person has grown up to be inclined towards this, there's something wrong here. Don't do it. But this person has become accustomed to doing it. Second nature to this person. 
in the next hadith, hadith number 56. Al-Thalithu an Abi Sufyan Sakhri bin Harbin radiyallahu an fi hadithi al-tawil fi qissati Hiraql. Qala Hiraqlu, famadha ya'murukum ya'ni al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala Abu Sufyan qultu yaqulu u'budu Allah wahtahu wa la tushriku bihi shay'an وَاتْرُكُوا مَا يَقُولُ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَيَأْمُرُنَا بِالصَّلَاةِ وَالصِّدْقِ وَالْعَفَافِ وَالصِّلَةِ مُتَّفَقْ عَلَيْهِ Now I'll present the history and the commentary. Sakhr bin Harb رضي الله عنه In his lengthy hadith in the story of Heraclius, the Roman emperor. Heraclius said, and what does he command you to do? Meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Sufyan said, I said, he says, worship Allah alone and do not associate with him anything and leave that which your ancestors said. And he commands us with prayer and truthfulness and uprightfulness and reconciliation. So this is the hadith. Now, just to give some uh, background of this hadith. At this point, Abu Sufyan, at this point, Abu Sufyan was not Muslim. Abu Sufyan, radiyallahu an, accepted Islam uh, on the conquest of Mecca. But during this narration, he is a Muslim. What happened? After the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi started to have letters written to the superpowers to governors, to political leaders, to kings and uh, tribesmen, leaders of tribes. So the Prophet ﷺ now is targeting the heads of tribes, heads of cities, heads of countries, heads of empires. One letter, which is Hiraki. In reality, it will take three, four sessions just to cover this one story. Uh, Sheikh um, Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala in Fathul Bari wrote, this letter reaches Heraclius and he doesn't read the letter immediately he knows that the letter is from a person from Mecca from the Arabs who claims to be a prophet so he knows that the letter is from someone in Mecca who claims to be a prophet when he received the letter Heraclius was roaming kingdom he was in uh, Sham, Syro-Palestine. He was in pa Palestine and some say he was in Jerusalem, Baytul Muqaddas at that time and the letter came to him. So Hassan's tribe or from amongst these people who is here. So he thought I want to before I read the letter let me hear about who is this person. And there is a whole history of Heraclius. Heraclius was a scholar of the scriptures as well as being the emperor of the empire. He was also a scholar of the scriptures. He was a scholar of the scriptures. He was a Christian and he was well versed in uh, reading stars. Nujumi. He was well versed in reading stars. Strife. He had prior knowledge of a person who is going to come. But he didn't know who that person was. Nonetheless, he asks the people to find someone and by chance, by divine plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Abu Sufyan? Abu Sufyan is the enemy of Islam at this point. He has fought against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for about 18 years. So Abu Sufyan and the tradesmen come to Heraclius. Heraclius brings Abu Sufyan forward to the translator. That say to him that I will ask him a question about this man who is claiming that he is a prophet. And people, if he lies, then you tell me that he is lying. And don't let him lie. If he lies, you tell me that he is lying. Abu Sufyan in the narration says, if I didn't fear that my people are going to call me a liar, I would have lied. I would not have told the truth to the king. The king asks a set of questions to Abu Sufyan, a number of questions to Abu Sufyan. Who is this person? Tell me about his lineage. Um, 
was there anyone from his ancestors who claimed prophethood, who was a king? Questions like this. Amongst those questions was this question that Imam Nawawi is mentioning in Riyadh al-Salihin. فَمَاذَا يَأْمُرُكُمْ What is he commanding you? So this person who's claiming prophethood, what is he actually telling you to do? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now Abu Sufyan tells Hiraki is commanding the people to do. So what Abu Sufyan is telling Heraclius is information that even non-Muslims are aware of. Information that even non-Muslims said, Qultu, I said, Yaqulu, he is saying, Worship Allah alone. وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا and do not and leave that which your ancestors were saying or have were used used to say. They say the reason why Abu Sufyan said this. First, he said, "Worship Allah alone," because that was the main message. But then he said, "Do not worship or do not associate with Allah any partners." The reason why he said, he also wanted Heraclius to look at the Prophet in a negative light because Heraclius was from the later Christians who also believed that Jesus was a divine being. So he wanted to show that his message is against your message. Because Abu Sufyan was very intelligent. Abu Sufyan was very intelligent. Radiallahu ta'ala and he accepted Islam. Once Abu Sufyan was traveling on a business trip and this was after the Muslims and the Kuffar of Mecca had some altercations, some battles. He's traveling on a business trip. He stops Amal Dung and he says to his caravan, let's change route. Ask him why. He says that the companions of Muhammad are close by. How did he know that from the camel dung? He looked at the camel dung and inside the camel dung were date seeds. And the only people that feed their camels dates are the people of Medina. So he realized the people of Medina are close by. So he changed his route and he avoided the Muslim because the Muslims were there. The Muslims were there and this was a military tactic. They came there to capture the caravan. Also Abu Sufyan was intelligent. He realized intelligent person. So he's giving information to the king so that the king considers Muhammad وسلم, somebody who's opposing him. And leave what your ancestors used to say. And leave what your ancestors... وَالْعَفَافِ Uprightness. وَالصِّلَةِ And reconciliation. Mending ties with relatives who have broken ties with you. <clears throat> Ta'ala, he says that in this message of Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan has gathered all of good character, all of good character. How? Virtue is either verbal or practice. If virtue is verbal, then it's called sidq. It's called sidq, truthfulness. If virtue is practical, fi'aliyya, then either it is something that's connected to Allah, or it is something that is connected to the person, or it is something that is connected to someone else. Virtue in your amal, in your practice, it's either connected to Allah, or it's connected to yourself, or it's connected to someone else. If the virtue is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is salah prayer. If it is connected to yourself, then it is ifa, uprightness, to be an upright person, to not do things which will make people look down. It is sila, reconciliation. So look at how Ibn Kamal has explained this hadith. So it's not as simple as just reading hadith. Sometimes when you read a hadith from uh, the interpretation of a scholar or a commentary of a scholar, you'll see it in a Amazing light. Abu Sufyan has mentioned this, but Ibn Kamal rahimahullah ta'ala is explaining and saying all virtue has been incorporated in this one narration. 
How? The virtue is either practical, it is either connected to Allah, therefore salah, or it's connecting, reconciliating, mending broken ties. And the final point I want to make and mention here. Islam emphasized Sidq so much. Even an open enemy knows that this is a message of Islam. This is a message of Islam. From amongst the things that Abu Sufyan mentioned, he mentioned Sidq, truthfulness. Because of how much Islam, how much the Prophet ﷺ emphasized being true. It's from those integrals that even a non-Muslim in the time of the Prophet ﷺ does not lie. A Muslim does not lie. The words that leave the mouth of a Muslim are true. The words that leave the mouth of a Muslim are true. This is a character that we should uphold. And they found out that you have lied. What will happen? You have now lost your credibility forever. If somebody lies to you and you find out it's a lie, every time they tell you something, you will always take it with a bit of hesitation. Let me see if it's true. Let me find out if this is true. Let me ask somebody else, is this true? But if somebody has never lied to you and they tell you something, they've never lied to you before, why would they lie now? At times, someone may come and that in itself is saying enough about that person. Sidq, truthfulness. Always hold firmly on to truthfulness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those who hold firm unto sabr and unto sidq, truthfulness.